Thank you, Cliff. Um, well, I think my presentation takes a slightly different tack, and um, and that is that it didn't. It's certainly not a minimal English project, but um, I think what I've found um, in working on this book, which I've brought some copies, you can have a look at. Um, the more I worked on the English, which was, if you like, the secondary part of the. Um, of the project initially, the more I saw that minimal English and obviously NSM, but minimal English um, was, was a very important um, tool that I should sort of make more of. And so I guess I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that I learnt from translating something from a language called Longu, which is a language that um, is spoken in the Solomon Islands on the main island of Guadalcanal. And it has about 3,000 speakers. And one of the keys in terms, I guess one of the things that's a bit different about talking about minimal English from this point of view too, is that the people there have very low levels of literacy. So I, one of the things I'd like to sort of say as a message is that where, where there are um, environments with low literacy, then of course something like minimal English is going to be particularly important. Um, all right, so that's the Solomon Islands, very close, not really very far from Australia at all, about three hours from um, Brisbane, but um, culturally very different. So the background is that I, um, as part of, I guess, as an outcome of a research project, and please hand these around so you can look at them, but don't, you know, not, don't worry about the English being less than minimal. Um, the purpose of them was to transcribe some traditional stories um, that I had recorded in the community and to produce a book for them. Um, the focus was primarily, for a long time, was on just the translation, and the, sorry, the transcription into Longu. And of course I wanted, and we, they wanted also, to have an English version. The English versions were never meant to be identical. In other words, they were oral stories that I had uh, trans re recorded and transcribed. I tried to stick fairly closely to that for the written Longu versions. But for the English, I wanted something a little bit simpler, and especially given that the audience for the books was the Long Longu people. So there was, you know, there were many reasons not to um, think about having to do exact translations, although they're quite close. The kinds of stories that are in the book are um, a selection of folkloric stories. Some are specifically that might be told to children to help them get to sleep or to scare them so they wouldn't run away from the village when their parents uh, were out working in the garden. Um, some of them are, uh, are sort of clan stories but not secret stories. So they would be the kind of stories that, let's say, um, Cliff's family would tell, you know, his extended family would tell to all of the extended family and they should know and that would be one way they could recognise they were part of that family. Um, but in any case, we also were quite serious about things like trying to get people from different villages, trying to make sure we had men and women, and so on. The purposes of doing it related to developing literacy in Longu. I'll talk a bit more about that. But also because of um, rapid social change um, in the Pacific, as you can imagine, in, as in everywhere, um, important to, as one way, not obviously not the only way, but one way to think about maintaining cultural knowledge. Because while many people knew some of the stories, uh, some people didn't know many or they knew one or two. So it, had that, it definitely has that cultural element. And in the light of um, a changing Solomon government um, policy on language, the, the way, what languages or which languages could be taught in the schools, it was also done to provide initial literacy materials for schools, right? Again, there's more to say about that, but that was just the initial purpose. So, the Solomon Islands is a former British colony or British protectorate, and so um, English is the language of education and the language of government. Um, but, of course, most people don't necessarily have high levels of literacy, and, but yet the schooling is in English. Um, many children would just go to grade six. In grade six, they have to do a, an exam, and if they don't do well enough, they don't go any beyond that primary school level. Um, there are growing numbers of children from the longer district going further onto education, but really very few indeed would go past grade nine or form three. And part of one of the reasons for that is the cost. So they just don't have the, the money to pay for the education. One thing I want to note, simply because they were, have been a great source of uh, support and, and collegiality in this project is that 
Um, often it was the older men who have better literacy skills in English than younger people, and that's partly because they were, um, well, men, not women, because men were allowed to work and to sort of stay on in education, um, and because they were um, taught, if you like, under a different system, and so often they, their literacy skills were, were somewhat better. Um, literacy in Longu, none, or effectively none. Um, Again, a few men in particular who had experience in, in translation between Longu and English, a little bit of that. And of course, some people do, under, if that, once you can read and the orthography is quite similar to English and so on, um, there's a way in which some people can cope, but it's very, very limited indeed. The one prayer book that is in Longu is, is, was actually um, translated by speakers of another language, so it's not quite the Longu they, they are totally familiar with. Um, but as I said, because of this change in uh, terms of the government policy, um, then there is this need and the government wants materials for schools. Um, okay. Um, okay, so one of the points I want to make is simply that um, because there is almost no literacy in Longu, but yet there is some literacy in English, it's really important as this Longu literacy is developing, and I'm sure it will take, you know, some decades in even, that there are materials and good materials um, that can be used in conjunction and translated and so on in terms of the longer material. So I guess there is this need for the kind of work that people like um, the people here in this room are doing and uh, to sort of take it into that context as well. Um, okay, so minimal English, of course, there are some reasons that we can say, well, of course, that's a good, um, I, I'll, I'll talk about it as a guide. I, as I said, I haven't done scripts. I haven't sort of tried to sort of stick closely to everything that's minimal English because the focus was on, the tra of, uh, was on translating the longu into, ling into, English, or to, um, into English and using um, minimal English as a guide. And of course, um, the fact that minimal English um, I'll say claims, and you know, I think test, test is, therefore is testable um, to be translatable. I think it's actually quite a nice perspective to take. Well, how useful is it when you're going from another language into, lang into English, as opposed to what sometimes we've been talking about, so perhaps in the case of um, Lauren's presentation, where you have more complex language that you're trying to make more simple. So I think they're sort of two sides. They're two. They're coming to the same point, but they're coming from different perspectives. The other thing about minimal English is the fact, of course, that it's not, it is more than the, um, NSM and that there are, of course, culture-specific terms. So um, that was also um, something that obviously would be part of the translations anyway, but it also links up into um, nice translations of Longu using the cultural terms, such as things like, p p that might be part of the environment, um, part of food products, things like betel nut and coconuts, but also cultural relations like chiefs or um, giants form, if you look at some of the stories, uh, some of them are all about giants, of course, mythical and so on, and words like sharks and canoes. So all of these just simply form, in one sense, form part of the translation. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the process of, of translation as well. Um, so in terms of translating these traditional stories into English, I didn't, if you like, have, um, I have this in mind initially, but really this is the process that happened. First of all, I did translate from Longu word to word, but of course you come up with the normal problems that one has when you're, for example, um, converting something from oral language to written language. So there were all of those kinds of issues, um, as well as keeping in mind the fact that the audience wasn't English speakers, I mean, sort of native English speakers, but the audience um, was a group of people who had some exposure to um, English um, materials or English um, t schooling. There are no books, by the way, that wouldn't be currently reading books or newspapers really. Um, but so that, that they were the focus, so it had to be sort of simple, but still reflect what was going on. Um, so, so I certainly, the more I worked on the English, the more I thought of the need to make sure or double check what I was doing with um, minimal English in mind, but of course it was still a translation, therefore it's much, it is definitely more complex um, than that. Um, I have a couple of, oh, so I just added, so one of the things too about the, the stories is that the illustrations come from people in the community and um, 
I just sort of wanted to point that, I wasn't sure if I'd bring the books, but I wanted to point that out as it being very much, uh, not a book that I did for them, but a book that we did together, including illustrations and including the fact that, um, you know, it, it certainly wasn't a one person um, uh, outcome. Okay, um, so some of the, I wanted to also present some of the issues that um, arose in my mind when I was doing the translations. And you'll see that some of these don't relate to minimal English, at least initially, they don't seem to relate to minimal English at all. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they form part of the thinking. Um, so firstly, one of the things that I thought would be quite important in the translations uh, was to keep the rhythm of the language. And I'm not sure why I think that's important, but I think, I think it's actually very important. It's not that difficult to do that in terms of the difference between Longu and English because uh, in Longu they have a lot of coordination, so it's and, and, and. Um, and in, not that I always translated things with and, 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 but what it meant is you could break things down into main clauses. You did, there's not a lot of subordination in the language and that fits nicely, I think, with the idea of a, a a, you know, a minimal approach to, um, to English. Another thing that's very common in the language, and I'll uh, talk about, it, it talk, this is important in a number of different ways, but is repetition. So I also kept in the repetition from the stories within the English, perhaps not to the same extent, but I thought that was important. Sometimes that repetition was in terms of phrases, um, but sometimes it was in terms of words, and that's where I'll talk a little bit about that and minimal English. One challenge um, that arose in, in the translations was, um, I mean, it's a normal challenge, but referencing participants in a story. Um, again, if you think about the um, context of an oral story or, uh, um, in an environment where everybody can see one another and knows the physical environment that you're talking about there are ho and the people, there are a whole range of ways in which you, things are obvious to within that sort of setting that is not so obvious within a written context. Um, but more than that, um, in Longu they have a, um, pronouns that include um, dual and porcal and plural and singular. They have inclusive and exclusive. So there's a way in which the pronominal system in Longu tracks reference really nicely that English doesn't allow. So of course that meant that there's a, there's a way in which the translations have to incorporate more noun, nouns and noun phrases to indicate that. Um, but again, that could be done in different ways and there was certain, and certainly being guided by you know, the kinds of, um, for example, semantic primitives, but things that might be part of minimal English, that was helpful in, in talking about things like the two, the two brothers or, or whatever. But it, it was a, just, just a helpful kind of part of the process. Um, another difference between spoken and written language for that language is that, is the, um, is that in Longu there's a variation in clause order in discourse depending on it's a, it's a, a, a pragmatic kind of um, effect about in terms of where you put the, whether the um, overt subject has to come at the beginning of the sentence or at the end is, is the basic way to say it. But of course, in terms of the translations, because I couldn't, didn't have the same linguistic resources, I had to make it much more subject verb object. In that sense, it looks much lo more like English. Um, and then another one, again, it relates partly to um, the difference between written and um, oral language, is to establish time and place um, in the stories. So perhaps you can see, or see at least with a couple of things that some of these might, might be helpful when we look at um, minimal English. Um, I've just given here, and you have some, some of the books circulating, so you know, I don't have to go through much of this, but just to give you an example, um, in the first paragraph, the giant kept singing behind. So I used behind like he was coming behind, but I tr tried to just keep it as behind. E is a longu interjection, so I didn't change that. Go on, go ahead, go ahead, we must go, he's coming. So you can see there's quite a bit of repetition that I thought, I'll just keep that in because that's part of the rhythm of the language. Um, and then you can see in the second paragraph, uh, things like they both went and they reached the kitchen. They made the fire and they both took one big stone. In other words, not making them complex sentences, just, in, just making them sort of declaratives with subjects and verbs. So this, was, this certainly reflected the longu, but also um, helped me to sort of just think about expressing things in fairly simple, in simple ways. Um, you'll recognise some words that would be part of minimal English um, or NSM. Um, 
one area that was, I needed to think about, as I said, was time and space or how time and space would, would be expressed. And so, again, you know, there are different ways you can do this. Um, in Longu, one way to talk about time passing is through repetition of the word go. So if um, sometimes men, men used to say to me that some of the women who told the stories, they used this too much, but it, but it was just a, a sort of a teasing thing. But basically to sort of repeat go, like lie, 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 you could, you, you could repeat it as many times as you wanted to, to, to indicate you know, long, a long, long, long time past. So in this sense, I, um, minimal English was really useful not to try to find too many different ways to express this, but to think about phrases such as after, after some time, those kinds of things. And indeed, go back and edit to some extent, um, edit some of the stories to actually check for these phrases. So I think that's another, I guess one of the tools or one of the things I learnt from doing it was that while in translation you might sort of think more about how closely you're sticking to the translations, use it, having some kind of you know, principles in terms of the kinds of terminology that you can use within minimal English is a good sort of editing check. You know, go back and see how often you've done that or, or have you made sort of more complex kind of constructions. Uh, so that was one way I, I used it. Um, here are some, some further examples, just, you know, again, things that you would expect, well, perhaps expect to find, but as I pointed out with the last one, sometimes these aren't direct translations. You know, sometimes there's some other kind of language in Longu, but I try to sort of make it sort of consistent in saying things like after some time, some time later, and, and so on. Um, okay, um, a further point is, and this only struck me fairly recently, when we look, well, Often, when you look at, if you like, what we might say good writing, good English writing, one of the ways in which cohesion is developed is through, um, uh, sort of lexical cohesion is developed is through things like synonyms, using a variety of language, not repeating the same thing again and again. Well, minimal English actually asks you to do something different. It actually says, try to repeat the same word and, uh, for example, whether it's want or say or no, rather than thinking of a synonym for that word. Now, what I found interesting about that is, in fact, that's what's in Longu anyway. There aren't a great deal, like, in terms of, say, basic terms like know and want and say in particular. Um, these are all there, and there's no need in the translation to try to make it, if you like, more interesting in terms of the purpose of the, um, the audience. It's a matter of using those words repeatedly, and that's both expressing or reflecting um, what's going on in, in Longu, but also it's, a, it's a, an, an, a nicer, cleaner kind of translation for people who have uh, low literacy skills, or well, low literacy in English. Uh, so there were a range of things that I found, particularly from, you know, like I could look at the NSM list or what's um, been done in, in um, minimal English, to see that there were quite a lot of things that were very, that came, came up very frequently. So terms like obviously live and die, say, some mental predicates um, and actions come and, and have. These were all words that were very frequent in their language anyway. So what's the lesson there? I guess the lesson is that um, sometimes it's actually easier to work from the other language than to, that you're translating into and make it something that's relatively simple in terms of minimal English than it is to go from more academic English into simpler English. And I want to give you another example of that in a minute. Um, oh, so here's just one example where I just kept repeating said, but indeed, in, so, we see, so perhaps in English, we, if it wasn't a translation, we might have used words like ask or reply. You know, somebody asked this, somebody replied. But in fact, in Longu, it was just said and said and said, right? So it, it's, um, I guess it affirms many of the choices, I think, that are being made in terms of NSM and minimal English in terms of the words that are translatable. So I didn't, so, so these words are translatable and these words occur very frequently um, in, in the language. Um, okay, before I get to this, um, I actually just wanted to say one thing too, like why talk about, why in a sense, why talk about this book or the work that I've done in terms of the translation side of this book. One of the things that struck me when I went there, so I returned these books in November, so they've only had them fairly recently. Um, and one of the things that the main chief and one of the uh, collaborators and storytellers said, he said, the English is good. So in other words, it matters. It actually matters to them that they get something that they can read in English, especially in the context where 
they don't have the same, they, can, they know the stories, they can, they can speak Longu, of course, uh, but their literacy isn't there with the Longu. So the English um, and, and how it's presented and whether it's clear to them is actually a really important part of what's going on. And so one of the things that I would argue is that as the, um, while, and of course, the importance of developing literacy in, the, in their own language is such an important thing, English isn't going away. But, but more complex English is um, a barrier to many people, both in terms of engaging or potentially an a barrier to people engaging in developing literacy in their own language, unless it's done well. Um, and it's clearly an, embar um, an embarrassment. It's um, clearly um, a, a barrier in terms of education and so on. So the more that the English can also support their ability to sort of develop literacy for those purposes, I think the important, the, that's a very important thing. Um, so in some ways, I think my experience was that it may well be easier to use minimal English coming from another language, especially a language, perhaps not a European language, but a language that, that does some of these things anyway. For example, um, coordination rather a lot of, than a lot of subordination, uh, high use of some of, the, ter of the, the verbs, for example, mental predicates or action words, um, allows a lot of repetition of the same words. Um, it's actually an easier job to think about um, incorporating minimal English into your process of translation than it can be um, in terms of, I'll call it academic English, but I just mean a more complex kind of English. And, and what was very striking to me was that when I came to write the introduction and acknowledgements for this book, um, which I still didn't do well at all, but I tried so many times to write it and it just and then translate from my English into Longu and it didn't work at all. It was just it just nonsense really. So I had to write it in Longu and then translate it back into English. And of course it's awkward and it's you know not as smooth as it could be a nice academic introduction. Um, and I also, although I kept the English words introduction and acknowledgements in in the book in terms of the English, I, of course, there was no translation for these words, and so I also had to think about, well, what is it? What are you doing in an introduction, and, and what could we call it? And um, I, I checked, I had to check later, unfortunately, but they were happy with what I did. So I basically decided that the way to talk about what an introduction was is to say, we begin, and with an inclusive pronoun. So this is our beginning. And the acknowledgements was very simply, uh, very good people. Uh, one reason I, jo I chose that is because the word for good, meta, is a kind of, um, it's almost a sort of symbol of that language and that people sometimes say, oh, you know that language, that's the meta language. They use, they use that word for good, nobody else does, they use it. So, but, in, <laughs> but in any case, I, I thought it was just, it just really highlighted to me that it's not a simple thing at all to, um, to write from, you know, a more kind of complex kind of English into into minimal English or into a simpler form of English um, and we shouldn't you know we should think of it as a long-term project for people who are trying to do it but you know maybe in some languages where you're trying to translate into English it's a really important thing to take that as your first step and say we really have to start at this point and maybe we have to become more complex in certain ways but maybe not. Um, okay so in conclusion um, while this was definitely not a minimal English project, I, the more I got into the English side, and that was the second half of the, the time I spent on it, I suppose, it really was a very important tool in making me feel a bit more comfortable about the translations. I should also add that before I started to think about that too much, I did get a few people who, who were neither linguists nor speakers of Longu or any other languages aside from English to read my English and they weren't happy. They didn't like it. They thought I hadn't done it very well. So there were ways in which I had to, if you like, um, account for people who, who would not be Longu speakers who I could still say, could you, you know, does this make sense or does this um, read well? And they didn't like it. And so I sort of worked on it from that point of view. But then I, I also sort of thought, but the audience is the longer people. So, you know, where is the balance? Um, and it's not saying I've reached it, but I was very pleased that they at least liked what I'd done. Um, middle, um, minimal English is definitely well suited to translating um, a, a language like Longu. Maybe not all languages, but it certainly seems to work well in that particular language. And as I've mentioned before, I think 
you know, it's important to maintain an interest in doing a good job with English while people are developing literacy in their own language because, you know, while that's important, they're only a, a you know, a group of th about 3,000 people, it's never going to, there are never going to be many uh, materials in that language. Um, and of course they need English for all sorts of other things. Um, I took this picture because this was this man, Caspar Volisondwa, because he was a translator, he had done some translations between English, I guess for the church um, and uh, Longu, he was really the only person who could pick up the book and start reading. Other people were like impressed or tried or they'd sound things out and, you know, it was a kind of an effort. But he was just, you know, loved it. And it started to rain very heavily shortly after that. And he just kept reading. He was, it was sort of under shelter, but not completely covered. Um, and he took the book away to read overnight and so on. So it's a very exciting thing for, for them to have a book that is, um, is theirs. Um, and that's, and, but as I said, it's both for their language and their maintenance or supporting the maintenance of culture, but also because they can access the English. Um, and because I know that handing a book to a community and saying, there's your book and there's your, uh, go, go for it, develop your own materials is not going to work at all, um, they'll, we'll be following up with if, if exactly how we can use it um, and what kinds of ways. And not necessarily in schools, it will also be sort of church groups and things. And so I really think that as we develop other materials that, that I will pay even more attention to minimal English as part of that sort of process and making sure that they've got things that, that are usable for people at the, with the literacy levels that they have. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>